alive. <laughs> It's alive. It's alive. Once again, I am not going to assign this a number. I'm going to allow Bronwyn to uh, assign a completely random number. 14,363. <laughs> 65, 54, 3, 2, uh... Too much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh... I'm hoping that, that this won't be too too much of an annoyance with the... I'm on a hammock, so um, I hope it doesn't sway too much. It's a beautiful day outside, and we are going to be discussing Joss Whedon's Much Ado About Nothing, uh, otherwise known as Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> that was a pet peeve of mine Only when... Until Joss Whedon came around. <laughs> I know, and when he first... When they start, first started announcing it, I, I mean, I, of course, I'm thrilled because it is my favorite Shakespeare play. But uh, I was also sort of like, does everybody forget that this is this is Shakespeare, not Joss? He may be producing it, but anyway, not that I don't love Joss. I do. I love Joss. Of course, and it's always interesting to see his interpretation of things. But yeah, um, also... he, didn't, he didn't write it so much. <laughs> exactly, and I, I think I I blogged about it like when it when they like first started talking about it because I, I was really thrilled at the idea that he could do something without killing off beloved characters because you can't rewrite Shakespeare. So um, it was going to be something that I would love that he couldn't, he couldn't hurt beloved characters and that I, I just, I yeah, this that. is a tool that he cannot use to hurt me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I was, I was thrilled that he was doing it. I was also, you know, cause it's really cool, but obviously whenever Joss does something, you know, your, your second response is, Oh no, what's he going to do to me now? You know? So, yeah. Um, I hate to admit it, but I thought that when I heard about him with Avengers, I was like, Oh no, he's going to kill them all. <laughs> I know. Right. And it's funny cause he really doesn't believe that he, that, you know, he should have this type of uh, reputation, but it's really hard to escape. I'm sorry. Exactly. He's uh, like, oh, it's not like I just kill people. I also bring them back. I'm like, do you remember Buffy the way I remember Buffy? Because he was not okay with being brought back. Like that was, you pulled her out of hell. That wasn't better, Joss. No matter what you tell yourself, that was not better. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, He's like, I, I, you know, I don't just kill people. I make you love them first. <laughs> oh. So yeah, my my Whedon phobia, my my my, uh, yeah, my my Whedophobia was was on high alert when when they first announced the project. But I I uh, I have to admit, it's pretty awesome. Pretty nailed it, right? Yes, there there are a few little bits because um, I've seen it several times. I, I, I the one with Kenneth Branagh is a I don't know I wouldn't call it a favorite necessarily, but um, I've seen it live uh, uh, a few times too. Yep. And um, so there there were a couple little bits and pieces that um, uh, where you could tell that perhaps the actors were not um, as comfortable doing a stage level production, which is, I, I mean, even though it was on camera, it's a play. It was written as a play. It was written for stage cues and things like that. And there are a couple of spots where you could tell like uh, they weren't quite sure what to be doing in this blank space, you know, sort of. Um, but on the whole, I mean, I, I really liked it um, a lot. Yeah, and and I was a little bit nervous, I, you know. Um, I think one of the reasons I'm not a huge fan of the Kenneth Branagh one is because uh, to Keanu. me, Keanu Reeves and Shakespeare are just. Um, it, uh, he's so adorable. Like he's a sweet he little guy. You know, it's just who casts him in Shakespeare? That's just mean. I know, and, and in and in the Matrix, I love him. I and, and I I do. I love him in so much. But uh, British accents and Shakespeare are just two things that are so. I don't know if dichotomous is the word I'm looking for exactly, but yeah, you just you can't you can't do Shakespeare with a blank look on your face. Yeah, because you know well. You can argue one way or the other with Shakespeare till the cows come home. The man had a wonderful grasp of the vernacular. He had a wonderful grasp of of entertaining the lowest common denominator. I mean, that's what these plays were aimed at. This was low, rough, everyday person kind of humor. He was trying to get 
across, right? So yeah, it, everything's very tongue in cheek. Everything's very a dirty joke. Everything, you know, like, yeah. this Shakespeare. You know, I mean, he broke every grammar rule before there was even a grammar rule. You know, like he, you know, he was the original like aiming at the masses kind of entertainer. And so the original Joss Whedon. <laughs> yeah. You know, he is, he's clever and he's, you know, he's funny and he's trying to get, you know, he's trying to get a good laugh out of everybody. So right. you always have to have that kind of inside joke look on your face because that's what he's going for with his comedies for sure, you know? Right. And if all you're doing is struggling through it, that can really come through. And so I just, I love Keanu. Like, he's Dora Bubble, but he was totally miscast. Right. No, and, and you're right, in, in The Matrix, he was awesome. And they summed it up nicely, I think, in the casting choice when, in The Matrix, the uh, Oracle turns to him and says, hmm, cuter than I thought. Not that bright, though. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> His poor guy's not for Shakespeare. It's not his fault. Not everybody yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and there are just certain people that unfortunately, you know, they get they get pigeonholed and they have a certain look and they're more built for period pieces or they're more built for comedy or they're more and you know, you can you can try and stretch your acting chops as much as you want, but it just, sometimes there's just there's just a uh, the, the puzzle pieces don't don't fit together properly and it it just doesn't Some people have the skill set to move beyond a typecast and some people just don't. Right. And uh, in 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 that sense um, Michael Keaton was also sort of an odd fit in that particular one. Um, where's the good Dr. Tam? I can never, I can never remember his actual name. Oh my God. And I usually can, but now all of a sudden I'm on the spot and I can't. Uh, <laughs> I really liked him. I, I, I was, yeah. I'm so used to seeing, uh, the good Dr. Tam from Firefly as, uh, just this sort of little more, Wholesome. And don't get me wrong. I mean, he he has to have some level of sort of badassery to be on on Firefly. They all did some things that were uh, not necessarily on the side of the angels, um, right. to use a, a Sherlock term. But yeah. uh, I really, I actually really did kind of like him playing this sort of devious, you know, um, Don John. It was it was very good. Yeah, I liked him in that role. I was, I and I, I always like to like him, so I wasn't sure if I was gonna wrap my head around enjoying, hating him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but I did. He was awesome. He was so, oh, manipulative. And <laughs> yes. Yeah, he pulled that off really well, really yeah. well. And I was so surprisingly impressed with Alexis uh, Denisov. Um, I thought he was hysterical when he's in there and he's dancing and he's, he's, you know, he's trying to be all alluring and he's doing his little poses. I had no idea he was such a physical actor. I was very impressed with him. I laughed my ass off all the time. Benedict, when he, Benedict right? Yes, that's Benedict, yeah. Yes. I, uh, I just thought he was hysterical. I really, really enjoyed him in that, in that role. I wasn't sure. I really, when, uh, when it, first pulled up and he was cast, I was like, well, okay, of course he's cast. He's a Joss Whedon friend. But um, I was a little concerned about how I would buy him in that role. But he he impressed the pants off me on that one. I I, I laughed. I laughed. I, I hid. I was awkward. I had to hide. I, seriously, almost a two-pillow movie, kind of. <laughs> when, when Beatrice uh, bids him come to dinner and he starts, like, exercising in front of her, that, that I was... I was cracking oh, up. Oh, I had to run away. <laughs> it was so awkward, um, and and I was and I I didn't know if I if I really kind of liked what he was doing. I mean, it, it took me a minute to kind of go, oh, he's trying to kind of like impress her, like you know, yeah, because um, it was a little it was a little weird, um, yeah. but you know, when when you think about it, I mean, most most actors when you talk about Shakespeare, um, you know, the one rule is the dialogue, and then everything else is kind of up for grabs. Um, and and they Beatrice and, and uh, Benedict both have scenes where they're hiding while while listening to someone uh, that they know talk about the other. <clears throat> um, and I I bought Beatrice's hiding places a little more <laughs> readily than I did Benedict. And oh, yeah. that's always something that's interesting to see how they pull that off on stage too. Is is uh, is how do you get someone to hide? Uh, while those things are happening, and, and he was a little more obvious. I mean, he did have like the one little, the one little, you know, sort of like stick of leaves that he put up in front of his face. But, um, but I thought he played it beautifully. You know, like yeah. 
he was so entertaining. And I just, again, I didn't, un, I didn't anticipate him being that good of a physical actor. Right. I, oh my God, I laughed uh, so much because uh, Jess shot this in his house, which is sort of amazing. And um, uh, he's got a, a really great house. He's got yes, just he fantastic. And, and um, I love the part where they're all like in the daughter's rooms. Like they've been, they've been led to like the little kids room. So there's stuffed animals and stuff. And then, and he talks about never, you know, am I ever going to see a, a, an unmarried man of 30 years old ever again? And he, yeah. he's sitting next to like a Barbie house. It's uh -huh. hilarious. <laughs> this, awesome. This giant bar, you know, plastic Barbie house, you know, complete with furniture and dolls, and you know, and he's talking about, am I ever going to see an unmarried man, you know, a bachelor of thirty again? And yeah, um, exactly, it was just funny. I just thought that was that was uh, well played. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> I oh, did not. God. I was not as impressed with which I, I have to say, like with hero. Yes. Yeah, because as like you know, kind of like a a, a more uh, better woman of her thirties, you know, or or somewhere in there, you know, like Beatrice. Like I I get why she's not necessarily like bawling during the scene where Hero is. Uh, um, it's the best word for that. I don't, jilted, I suppose. <laughs> uh, in a very public sense, um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> jilted and outed, and and, uh, and and anyway, um, I I expected to see a little more from Hero on that being a, a girl who is probably barely out of her teens, as far as the way that Shakespeare wrote that. Um, you know, if she's out of her teens, you know, that, that sort of starstruck, you know, oh, I love him the moment I see him, we're getting married tomorrow sort of thing. You would expect more uh, of a breakdown from her when he accuses her of, of infidelity or of whatever that is exactly, um, adultery, you know, having an affair with, with uh, one of Don, John's um, dudes. Yes, exactly. And she was just sort of a little more blank and quiet. I, I would expect a teenage girl to be sobbing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not quite as self-possessed as she is. I know. She was just so so calm and centered. And I was like, no, I just don't. I don't. Mm. No. Yeah, she was a little bit meeker yeah. than, than I was hoping. She had one moment sort of at the end when her face is revealed where she's sort of looking at him like, you're going to pay for this later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, all right. Okay. But uh, yeah, for the most part, but Hero's never been one of my favorite characters to be honest. Yeah. So. Although I think Kate Beckinsale did a good job. It was, it was, I think the first time I ever saw her act in anything. And I, I really liked that when That's in, true. In I did like her. Kenneth Branagh's version. I don't know, but that was a more uh, sort of bubbly, version. This was a more drunken emo sort of version. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> um. yeah, it, was, it, it was actually really interesting for me, the sort of um, weird divergence between the setting and the language. Yeah. Uh, which I actually liked, and I think that the, the filming in black and white kind of helped create that. It's almost like a noir kind of yes. setting. You know, it was very smart right out of the gate the way that uh, Clark Gregg holds up his his cell phone in order yeah. to say that he's received like an email or a text. You know, yeah. um, and you know, as because the the original language refers to a letter that he would have received by a snail mail, which you know, like nobody does anymore. And yeah. and so it's sort of very smart the way that they did that. Um, and the and can way we that they just have a moment to fangirl all over Clark Gregg. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, you can't not love Phil Coulson. My, right? but... my favorite, yes, and my favorite part is where is you know when when they are having the discussion. It's it's Clark, Greg, and Hero and Beatrice, and they're talking about Benedict, and yeah. uh, and the the maid is making out with that guy in the background. He's like, yeah, <laughs> <Hello>. stop. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, seriously. I know. I was cracking up. I was like, you know, it, it, I I love the fact that they brought in something like that, you know, yeah. and and that that they were able to, you know, 
bring in that sort of human moment right there instead of just making it, you know, all about the dialogue, that there were still, like, a regular household, there would be other things going on in the background, especially at a drunken party. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man, I seriously, I loved him. And it, to the point, I loved Colin Greg. Like, I, I just, he came out, and, he, you know, with the cell phone moment, that was it, and I was just like, oh, I love him. When did that I happen? Know. Like, you know, <laughs> and then, and I, of course, like, this is my favorite Shakespearean comedy for sure. Yes. Um, but I'll admit, it has been a couple of years since I read it, and a couple of years since I'd seen an interpretation of it in any form. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of forgotten quite how period it is. And, you know, so yeah. when they set up the drama, and it's all seven door first, and he said, she said, no, if they only just communicated for a second, none of this would have happened, and we wouldn't right. have a movie. You know, <laughs> which is really <laughs> like, really awkward. And, um, and I know that that's true to the story, and it has to happen to be part of the story. I get that. Right. But there was a moment where I had been so sucked in, was so sort of enjoying these characters, with especially Clark Gregg, actually, yes. um, that when, you know, when Hero is, is, is sort of cast aside in this high drama fashion at the wedding, and Clark Gregg doesn't immediately jump to her defense. Mm -hmm. And I know he can't. Like, it's not part of the script. I know that. Right. right. <laughs> I was so upset. Don't want him to, though. I was so upset. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, and, and in the other in the other iterations that, that I had seen, um, I, you fully expect it. You understand it. You know, this, and, and in this particular version, because I think he's such a righteous dude as Coulson, yeah. we all kind of did expect him to jump in and be like, hey, wait a minute. That's my daughter Let's you're talking talk about. about this. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and he didn't. And we were, uh, yeah, I had. Oh, it was like a knife in the heart. <laughs> I know. Little, little mixed emotions there about that, you know, but it was, it was well played. And also Fran Kranz, who I adore. You know, I have such a soft spot for Fran Kranz. And so for him to be the one casting her aside in this public fashion, I was just like, you little jerk. Don't, don't do that. That's not cool. <laughs> Never mind that this script is 400 years old. Don't do that! <laughs> <laughs> I did, I, I love the party scene too, by the way. The masquerade, oh. that is, that is uh, historically always very interesting, I think, to watch the different iterations and see the entertainment that shows up at the party. Yeah. Um, and it's always, it's, it's always sort of telling of one's budget <laughs> as to <laughs> what ends up entertaining people at that party. And in this case, it was sort of Cirque du Soleil-ish, which was kind of awesome. But at the same time, they had that, the, you know, sort of great jazz soundtrack. And um, yeah. that was very, very telling and very interesting. I, I, you know, um, I, I did a lot of research into historical costumes when I was younger. So uh, that was one thing that really bothered me a lot about the Kenneth Branagh version was that none of the costumes were, you know, they were, they were reminiscent of something historical, but they were not really historical. And so... To not have that um, be up front and in my face where I have to sit and because I have one of those brains that immediately, um, it's an admin brain, sees something wrong and wants to fix it. And so when, I, when I'm looking at a period costume and I go, oh, that's not right, that's not right, that's not attached there, you can't wear that like a dress, it doesn't, you know, those pieces are all separate. That's, that's how my brain functions because I did so much work on, uh, and research into, into that sort of an area for a while. It was nice to have that removed, yeah. and they're just wearing cool clothes. That was awesome for me, not to not to have that piece just sort of you know tweak me throughout the yeah. film or throughout the play, uh, to be able to to relax and enjoy it without that. Um, it's amazing, right? Like the little details can very much knock you out. Yes. You know, if somebody says, "I'm going to set this piece in the in 1942." And then they proceed to set it, and it's actually 1936. Well, yeah, it's not that different, but if it was going to be 1936, why did you tell me 1942? You know, like, right. it, if you're not going to be specific to the genre that you are announcing that you're, you're going to do, then just don't be specific, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. But this was, this was just beautifully melded of... of you know, this, this, exactly. uh, you know, like you said, 400 year old script and then modern times, it was really well melded together. And I think the black and white 
aided in that tremendously. I think if it was in color, it would get yeah, it like, um, even it would it would be dated very quickly. Um, but the fact that I think of the matter is, I think that in the next ten years or so, I think it'll hold up really, really well, at least because it is in. Play. I think it bridges the time gap nicely. Yeah. Yeah, and and there were all of the clothes were sort of classic lines and nothing, you know, um, too modern. I mean, even some of the dresses that Beatrice wore were almost the sort of reminiscent of the 1930s. Yeah. Um, just just classy and beautiful. Um, and because of you know some <laughs> some of the things that are in the background or or not in the background. I mean, like the the Barbie house. Like I had that Barbie. House. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's amazing. You know, hilarious. Um, you know, and and then like the phone, it's just a glimpse. It's not. It, it's not. You know, showing massive technology all the time, or you know, um, they still. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that siren in the background. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is okay. It happens. Um, uh, because they they didn't focus on those things where uh, oftentimes when you take a period piece and you try and update it or you know as Hollywood likes to say reboot it, yeah. they tend to focus on more modern details. They tend to focus on the cell phones and the iPads and the the technology in the background and the you know the game systems, the televisions, the phone, all that stuff. And this was such a passing glimpse. Um, yeah. It was it was just really well done. And can we take a minute to talk about Nathan Fillion? We can take ten minutes to talk about Nathan Fillion. I'm fine with that. He was so adorably funny in this movie. I was dying. I just thought he was hysterical when he just keeps saying, "And I'd like the record to show that I'm an ass." Like, <laughs> see, and I think I think he got it because there there are versions of that particular character, and I, I the constable. I can't I can't for the life of me recall. Um, if you can look it up on IMDb, I can't see really well. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and no sunglasses and the laptop outside. Um, but like when Michael Keaton played him, he came off as like sort of uh, not just crazy, but slightly deranged. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was a fun character for sure. And, and I'm not saying I disliked Keaton's version, but he was a little confusing, I think. Um, and I think Nathan really kind of understood the nuances of, of you know, sort of being this off-kilter. Well, I think he understood that he was part of a comedy. Yes. And and I, he got the sarcasm that was built into the lines um, uh, and, on a different level than, than Keaton. Yeah. And people, I think, struggle with understanding that Shakespeare is actually, um, like, it is a, actually a comedy, you right. know? You know, Shakespeare writes in a very different spot style because, of course, like the Shakespeare, Shakespearean writing is hundreds of years old, as we previously mentioned. Right. So it was the vernacular of the time. So just because it's not the current vernacular doesn't make it any less sarcastic, doesn't make it any less dirty, doesn't make it any less funny. You know, right. Right. <laughs> he was aiming for inside jokes. He was aiming for people in the front row who paid a penny to get in, who, you know, worked all day, who were not rich and landowners. These were, you know. Right. So I think Nathan Fillion, his performance anyway, to me, showed a deeper understanding of where Shakespeare is actually aiming his his writing. Right. So right, it was a, it was a very charming portrayal. I think yeah. he did a he did a, a very good job. Whereas Keaton's was a little more uh, crazy. Yeah, with the invisible horses and <laughs> just sort of like. I, I was watching it and I'm like, I've seen this before and I still don't understand what he's doing. No. <laughs> no. I just, yeah, didn't get it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and I mean, the character himself is a little bit, you know, sort of goofy and, and you know, written to to be, um, you know, sort of a break in, in some of the drama that does go on. Um, and, I think you know, and this is this is one of one of the the plays that he that he wrote that Shakespeare wrote where it sort of very neatly ties up some things, like you know, uh, towards the end when uh, Beatrice and Benedict are talking, they're like, you know, well, I thought you loved me, well, I don't, I don't love you, like you know, they get into that conversation. Yeah. It gets cleaned up very very quickly with 
letters that have been written in, in, in both of their hands about the other one and how much yeah. they love it and sort of, you know, sort of how that magically pops up at the right moment and, you know, clears up that situation so everybody can be married and live happily ever after is very un-Shakespeare <laughs> to have that yeah. sort of neat and tidy at the end, which shows you how much of a comedy this was meant to be, you know? Exactly. Exactly. This was supposed to be satisfying. This was supposed to be, let's introduce some characters, let's introduce some drama, let's wrap it all up so everybody goes home happy. <laughs> let's go out for a beer afterwards. And <laughs> exactly. No oranges need to be thrown at the stage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, I loved, oh, I just, I thought he was adorable in that. And when they, I love that whole scene where they're establishing the role of the guard, you know, so do this, but not if anyone confronts you, then just, then don't, just let them be. But don't let them do this unless they want to, because stopping them would be rude. And you got to <laughs> watch out for this, but don't do anything about it, because that's not our place. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that whole section. Yeah, and I and I love. And they're how... so proud of themselves. They're like, "Yes, this is an important job." Yeah. And let's go sit on the church bench. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand. Okay, but uh, yeah, that, that's always, that's always been something like like is that a place where things happen? Like I just it, like ever since I I first read it, I, that's always been like oh. sort of like a confusing little bit for me. First time I, I read that. Uh, I read the play. I just didn't understand like the whole church bench thing. Is that some place where things happen? I don't know. It's sort of odd. Uh, yeah, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> church bench is a happening place to find out weird things about what's what's going on in town. Well, I suppose um, at the time the church would have been a social place to be, right? <laughs> yeah, I, it was like two o'clock in the morning, and yeah. The other thing too is um, the way that the the way that Clark Gregg. Uh, talks to um, the cops, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but just boil it down. Um, the way that he talks to the cops, I thought, was was sort of very, sort of like, okay, you're kind of, I'm, I'm being respectful, but you're bothering me a little. Like, can we move this along? Like, that was really well played, I thought. Because sometimes yeah. people uh, who play his character tend to get a little angry, um, where yeah. you... I don't. I don't think you would be doing that with a with a figure of the law. You'd probably be a little more respectful. So he's kind of sarcastic. He plays it sort of sarcastic and irritated. Yeah, which I thought was hysterical though. Like he's he played it like I'm the Lord of the Manor, so you're the law, but you don't really stretch to me. But because I'm a good guy, I'm gonna let you have this one. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I'm I'm just I'm really busy. So could you just tell me what to do? <laughs> just sort of like, you know. I awesome. love it. it was yeah, really he's like, cool. well, as you can see, I might be doing some stuff. So maybe we take the long story down a notch. <laughs> 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 oh God. Well done. Yeah. I was really excited when I heard this was coming out, and I was really excited. I was even more excited when I saw the trailer, and then, um, I, so I, like I said, there were there were a few minor things, but I I think, um, any so any transition from play to screen is is going to have you know some some little rough spots that need to kind of be shinied up a little bit, and that was I, this was no exception, you know. Yeah, I I found it was interesting that I they didn't really mark the. Um, the scene transitions the way I was expecting. So at first that was a little bit like, oh, oh, okay. But by the end of the movie, I wasn't noticing anymore. Right. Right. And I, I think um, that house was also uh, a, a really, he, he's, uh, he's got a lot of stairs and a lot of balconies in the house. <laughs> so it lent itself yeah. very well. <laughs> I wonder it, if it, the house was part of the source of the inspiration. Hey, I gotta do that movie. This house would be perfect for it. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, he's you know they had some. He's got some some great sort of terrain around the house, and and uh, it's beautiful. Uh, just a lot of architectural detail and stuff. I'm sure lent itself to that very well. I still I still think he's crazy really? for doing that in his house because I mean that's got to be ridiculous. I mean, 
can't have a thing out of place on any given day, you know. Exactly. Let alone, Man. you know, use it's of your house when you want to. Yeah, what? true. <laughs> well, does he, like, he, I don't actually know that much about Joss Whedon personally. Does he have a family? Like, is this something yeah. that they just have to regularly deal with? <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he's got a wife and kids, so, um, yeah, yeah, I, I remember him talking about mm -hmm. that when, um, when at, at uh, San Diego Comic-Con, when Nathan interviewed him for um, Zach Levi's group. Um, I can't. Ah, uh, yes, uh, Nerd Machine or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah, he he did the the moderator for that, and is and Josh shows up in this T-shirt that is probably twenty years old and full of holes and. Um, <laughs> It looked like he just got done remodeling his bathroom or something. Just, he like climbed out of bed and just went on why the would interview. You, why would you dress up, right? Yeah, exactly. See, things like this also fall down from the tree. Well, <laughs> so if you see me jump, I because I'm never sure what it is. Oh, it's a little pod. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but sometimes there are ants. I like it. You know. You know. <laughs> um. But uh, but yeah, he was yeah, talking about um, how he must have. Yeah, he must nobody. <laughs> how it was really hard to to shoot in his house, and I was thinking about like the logistics of of doing that, you know, and and not being able to use your own home the way that you need to on a daily basis, and that's got it. That one must have been rough, but seriously. Anyway, he was like, "Well, we're gonna shoot in my home, so I think we're gonna stay in a hotel for a few weeks." Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> That's what I would do. I'll just move in with Nathan. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How convenient. Yeah. Oh, He's got gosh. lots of friends. You know, he can move in with his brother, one of his brothers, you know? Like, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're going to film here, so you're going to let us. Um, so, I love it. Sorry, I, was, I, think that, I think that one was an ant. But yes, overall impressions. Mm -hmm. I I thoroughly enjoyed that movie. It made me very happy. Me too. Oh. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'm gonna call it a day. So this has been much do about. Well. Bring out your geek and I may never do this outdoors again. Joss Whedon, not tell you both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>